Okay, here we go. And we'll give everybody a few minutes to log in. Good morning, Ferias. Good morning. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, now we're good. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Ethel. Good morning, Marcos. Good morning. Oh, my volume's all the way down. Let me turn that up. Good morning. Oh. Yeah, that's why I was like, I need something. <laughs> How's everyone's morning going so far? Have you guys been productive today? Have you guys been Good. calls? Talk to any clients? Gotten any new leads? Uh, not yet today. Not yet today. <laughs> yeah. Well, today's Friday. So remember, today is like the Christmas Eve of Christmas. Remember, the weekend is our game day. So Friday is preparation, preparation, preparation for the weekend. Even if you're not physically going to go out and do anything like an open house or showings, you should at least be prepping something for the weekend. Um, maybe you're going out to see somebody over the weekend, a family member or a friend. Is there anything that you can offer them that's real estate related um, that they might find of value? Um, what about social media content? That's something that we've been working on. 
most of you are still kind of getting a hang of it and you're not very consistent with your social media. So Friday is a good day to take and at least plan what you're going to put out on social media for the weekend. Um, I learned this cool new trick that Anai actually showed me. I can, um, so you can go into your social media and um act as if you're going to submit a post so put up your picture do your writing tag whoever you're going to tag so change the lighting on the picture do everything that you're going to do and when you get to the end you're just going to hit the back button and you're going to go back and back and back and it's almost it's scary the first time so you can try it um if you want first without putting too much effort into it because it looks like you're about to cancel everything out but on the last back, it'll ask you, do you want to do you want to um, trash this post or do you want to keep it as a draft? And you can keep it as a draft. And now whenever you go in tomorrow or Sunday, you can put it up. And then remember, um, Monday is Labor Day. So it's a three day weekend. A lot of people are off. A lot of people are going to be hanging out and they're going to be on social media. This is a really good weekend for you guys to be active on social media. If you're not doing any other type of uh, prospecting, open houses, showings, please be on social media. So at least you guys can do that as of right now. Okay. I want to give everyone just a couple more minutes to jump on. We usually have everybody jumping on within the first 10 minutes. So let's just give them a few more minutes. But I wanted to throw that in there while we wait on everyone. We're just waiting on everybody to jump in. What else? Anybody else have anything good planned for the weekend? Is anybody doing showings or open houses or anything? No? Yes, I have an open house tomorrow. Oh, fun. Uh, in the morning, yeah. West yeah. side or east side, Ethel? West side, in Upper Valley. Oh, nice. Have yeah. you posted? Uh, not yet. Okay. So remember yeah. your stories, your stories, um, it'll stay for 24 hours. So I would recommend you start posting. What time is it at? I'm sorry. It's at 10, 10 to 2.30. So right now is the perfect time to post. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, as soon as we get off of this meeting, do a, a quick posting for your open house so you can post on your story. You can mm -hmm. post on your feed, but remember when it's on your feed, eventually it's going to get to the bottom of the feed and less and less and less people see it. Yeah. So actually what I would do is I would post a couple of times on my feed. But if you know you're not going to do it, if you know you're not going to post three times on your day, just post on your story at least yeah yeah i'll do it and and it's the same house that i i i'm going from punta living so i have the information oh okay okay sounds good yeah good morning lilia we're just catching up on what everybody has planned for the weekend do you have any plans for this weekend um, nope <laughs> nope all right well if you're not doing any prospecting open houses showings make sure that you're active on social media this weekend it's labor day weekend a lot of people are going to be on social media post something post anything it doesn't even have to be real estate related it can be you with your kids you with your husband boyfriend friends you by yourself selfies are very good posts I know that not all of us like taking selfies. Trust me, it's something that I've had to work on. Um, I still don't feel 100% comfortable doing it, but it is one of those posts that's gonna get good engagement. Remember when somebody decides to follow you, 
um, on social media, it's because they want to know what's going on with your life. They like seeing you. They enjoy seeing you and what you have going on. So, you know, try to try to conquer that fear. If you have a fear of taking picture or phobia and, and challenge yourself to post yourself something um, over the weekend. So without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get yeah. started. I'm sure we'll yeah, have Denise, a Denise, can I ask you something? Yeah. It's, mm -hmm. it's not related with the theme, but do you remember you told me how to make flyers uh, on the on the MLS? I don't remember the keyword. Uh, iCloud. 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 iCloud will um, help you make some quick flyers. Um, Angie's actually the one that taught us how yeah, to make them. So but it, it was not iCloud. Cloud. Cloud with i cloud? without i. Cloud. Just yes, on the, CM, yes, on the Flex yeah. MLS. Okay. Yes. I got it. Yeah, thanks. You're welcome. All right, guys. So let's go ahead and get started. Today, what we're going to be talking about is what a transaction looks like from start to finish. Um, I will do the best of my ability to explain it. Um, and I'm going to explain it to you guys as if we were doing a hypothetical transaction. <laughs> okay. Um, I wish I had a little something to draw pictures just because I'm a very visual learner. So I'm going to do my best. But if it gets confusing, um, just stop me. Just just tell me if you have a question right away because you need to follow along every single step. If at any point you get lost, stop me. We need to, we need to make sure that you're tracking along the entire process. OK, so we are going to go through a hypothetical sale. Um, we've talked about the sellers before. We're going to talk about buyers today. Okay. For the most part, once you have an executed agreement, and what's an executed agreement? Anybody? Yeah, the one we, that we we have the okay from the seller and the buyer, so it's executed. Yes. So and it's it's signed and, and everything. signed. Yes. yes. So buyer and seller have agreed to not only the price, but all the terms of the agreement. And we have a signed agreement. Both parties have signed. Now it becomes executed. That's where the executed date comes from. That's why it's important for your seller and your buyer whenever they sign the contract they date it on the bottom. And if you're going back and forth with changes on the initials, that's what's so cool about doing it electronically because electronically it's auto automatically going to give you what we call a timestamp. Okay. The timestamp is going to have the date and the time, or I don't know if it has the time. Usually it has both, but the date it's going to have on there. And that way we can look at it and say, okay, Mr. Buyer was the last one to sign on September 1st. Um, Mr. Seller had signed the day before, so the executed day is September 1st. Remember, as realtors, we're working with a lot of legally binding agreements, and the dates are super, super um, important for us to keep track of. So now we've got an executed contract, and we are representing the buyer, okay? We are the buyer's representative. We are representing Mr. and Mrs. Buyer. The very first thing that needs to happen as soon as you guys get that executed agreement is you need to send that executed agreement to all the parties involved. So who would be a party involved that needs to get this contract? The title company. Title company. The lender. The lender, yes. The okay. lender needs to know right away because okay. remember, we have on the third party agreement, it gives us yeah. 10, 15, 20 days to get the approval. Remember, when our clients come to us, most of the time they're only pre qualified. So they've They've gone through the, the first step of getting that qualification, but getting pre-approved is something different. That's when the lender actually verifies the documents to see that everything that they put on their application is correct. Okay. A lot of things come up during this process. For example, if Mr. Buyer and Mr. Seller on their application um, accounted for all of the overtime that they've been getting, guess what? Overtime is calculated differently through a lender. 
Overtime is not calculated just as a normal wage. So the lender has to go in and they have their little formula that they use, but- what, Sorry, what, what is the overtime? I don't know what's that. Overtime, so um, here, here in the United States, if you work for, as an employee, if you work 40 hours a week, that's full time. After 40 hours, it's called overtime or time and a half. If you're an employee, you typically will get paid whatever you get paid. So let's say you get paid $10 an hour, just to keep the number simple. $10 an hour, but you work three hours of overtime. So it, it would be your hour 41, 42, and 43. You're going to get paid $15 per, per hour after that. So a lot of times we get clients that get overtime every week and they're used to getting overtime or they get it every month. And so when they go in with their application and the application asks, how much do you make every month? They will put on their $6,000. But of the $6,000, maybe 1,500 is overtime. Well, the overtime gets calculated differently than their base pay. So that's something that usually gets caught during the pre-approval process. So yes, definitely you want to send the contract to the lender ASAP. And when you send out these documents, make sure that they receive them. Um, this is why email communication is so important. And, and, and what you say in that email is very important too. Most lenders and most title companies have pretty good email etiquette for the most part. Um, this is the way that they handle most of their transactions and most of their business, but never ever assume that they received your email. If you send something and they don't let you know that they received it, email them back, call them, text them. Hey, I just sent you um, an executed agreement for Mr. Buyer and Seller on 123 Main Street. Have you received it? Can you please confirm receipt? This is also to protect you guys. Remember, we are a business now. So you have to conduct yourself as such. And if you are a business, people are waiting for the opportunity to sue you. I'm so sorry to put it to you that way, but it's true. People are waiting for an opportunity to sue you. The second that they see that you're a little bit successful, they are waiting and they're watching to see when you slip up. So you need to cover all of your bases. And when you send something and you think, okay, I've done my part, not if they haven't confirmed that they received it. So if they don't confirm that they, um, at the end of every email, um, you get anybody that's received an email from me has seen that if it's something that I need to know that you received it, which is most things going out email, I'll put on the bottom, can you please confirm once you have received? Can you please let me know once you get this? It's as simple as that. They'll usually do it. If they don't, I'll reach back out maybe a day later, maybe sometime later in the afternoon, um, and then check on them that way. So, and then I'm going to jump really quick into follow-ups too, because I think this is important for you guys to know. We're going to do, we're actually going to do a time blocking course next week that I'm super excited about. And this is just a little, a little taste of what it's going to be. Get into the habit of scheduling your follow-ups at certain times. This is going to help you not go so crazy with all of your work. Okay, this is what my schedule looks like. I think it works fabulous. I love it. And I would recommend you guys adopt it, adopt it at least to try it. Okay. At nine o'clock in the morning, I send out all my emails, text messages, any follow ups, anything that I, any information that I'm trying to get out, send it out at 9am. I expect, so let's say I sent out an executed agreement at 9am. I expect that the title company and the lender between 9 and 1 p.m. have had a chance to look at their emails and should be able to tell me, got it, received. One word, two words, quick and simple. Quick and simple, it's not gonna take, it's, it's not gonna take them but two, two, 30 seconds to type that out. If I have not heard from them, if I sent it out at nine in the morning and I haven't heard from them by one and I use one o'clock as my, my afternoon time because I want to give them time to have lunch. If they have a lunch break, 
I'm thinking from noon to one is lunch. It's afternoon now. Like it, it really is afternoon now. I'll follow up. Hey, I sent you a, hey, Mr. Lender, I sent you a contract earlier this morning. Just want to make sure that you received it. And then I leave it alone and I let them get back to me. If I still have not heard back, I will try again at 5 p.m. 5 p.m. is end of the day, somewhere between, somewhere between four and five usually. Four and five is end of the day. For me, that's when I want to close up my books for the day. So I might have appointments later on that day. I might have a phone call that I need to get to, but for the most part, I want to be done with work at five o'clock. So if I sent you something since nine in the morning, and you still haven't gotten back to me, I'm gonna check one more time between four and five. Now, if you've emailed and text these people um, earlier in the day and you've gotten no response, you have to get a little more aggressive at the end of the day. You have to pick up the phone and call them. Pick up the phone and call them. If they're not available because they're in a meeting, ask to speak to their assistant, ask if anybody else can give you the response or just go and check. Um, most of our title officers and lenders have assistants and a lot of their assistants have access to their emails um, or you should be copying their assistants in or you can send it to their assistant. You know what? I don't have access to their email, but can you send it to me? Great. You want to get it out of your hands as quickly as possible, but until they confirm that they've received it, it's not out of your hands. It's your job to make sure that they received it. Okay, so 4.30, 4 to 5 o'clock is the last time that I'll check up. And then again, tomorrow morning, if for whatever reason I didn't get the response that day, again, tomorrow morning, it's the exact same schedule. 9 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 4 to 5. Okay, this is what helps me just keep myself a little bit more organized. So I'm communicating with people, you know, between... 9 to 10, usually 10.30, and then again from about 1 to 2, 2.30, and then again from about 4 to 5. And in between time, I get to do my stuff. I get to do my CMAs. I get to schedule my showings. I get to look at the MLS hot sheets. I get to do everything else that I need to do, okay? So going back to, to, a, to, to our, our purchase, right? Now we've executed the agreement. We sent it out to all parties involved. You also need to make sure that the other agent gets a copy of the listing agreement, okay? Whoever, whoever was the last person to, have, to, get the, uh, to get the signatures needs to make sure that the other agent also gets a copy of the executed agreement. So usually that's the first person that we send it to but sometimes you forget, sometimes you're, you know, and, and so what I have is actually an email template. Um, and in the email, it says, here's the title officer, he's, here's the lender, here's the buyer's representative, here's the seller's representative. And in there, it has everybody's contact information, everybody's email, and then the, the contract goes out to everybody. So remember, you can send it to, Two is who you're sending that email directly to. You can also carbon copy, B, or CC. Whenever you see CC, it's to include other people in the email, make sure that they get it, um, but it's not directly to them. So you wanna include like the, the assistants in there. If they have a transaction coordinator, you actually wanna send it to the transaction coordinator and copy the agent. That's the reason they have a transaction coordinator because that person is there to handle the administrative stuff. So now we've sent it out to everybody. What's the next thing that we need to do after everybody has a copy of the agreement? We need to set all the dates because we have due dates and uh, we need to, to be very accurate with those days because you have, we have to send the earnest money the option money, there. then the lender has... Okay. There, there. Earnest and option. Earnest and option, those are the first two things due, okay? Earnest and option money, get them out ASAP. When I talk to my buyer and I do my buyer's presentation, for anybody that was here for the buyer's presentation, I let them know, hey, when we go out and look at houses, I'm going to start asking you for this money right away. The second you tell me that you found a house that you like, this money needs to be made available. So I've had clients that thought they were ready 
And as soon as I told them that, they're like, you know what, Denise, we need to wait. Give us another month and we'll and then we'll start shopping. And that's exactly the reason that I do it because how how much would it suck for us to go and show them especially in this market for us to go and show them 15 houses get out bid on five of them you know be up and down all hours of the day and then we finally get an executed agreement and they're having a hard time coming up with that money you don't want to deal with that so let them know at your buyer's presentation earnest money and option money are going to be due as soon as you agree as soon as we get a uh, seller to agree to our contract we're going to need that money so even though they have three days to get it i usually work on trying to get it asap i i don't even tell them you have three days to get it i'm just like hey we need this as soon as possible this is where the title uh the earnest money is going to go and this is where the option money is going to go so earnest money Earnest money goes to the title company. Remember, the earnest money is held in escrow. What is escrow? Escrow is a third party account. So neither the buyer nor the seller nor their representatives is holding this money. It's in an escrow account and that gets held at title. The option money goes directly to the seller, is non-refundable. It can be credited to the purchase of the sale. So as long as they go through with their sale, they will get credit for that option money, but that's not refundable and that goes directly to the seller. So where do you send the option money? You talk to the listing agent and ask them where that should be delivered. Some listing agents want you to deliver it to their office and some will tell you to mail it directly to the seller. Most listing agents will tell you to send it to their office and that's what I would recommend is actually having it go to the office because you want to get a receipt. You want to get a receipt and as much as I trust and believe in our postal office, I send stuff via postal mail all the time. The fact that there is room for error and we have such a limited amount of time to get it there, it's just in my opinion safer if you have the client go directly to the listing office uh, the listing agent's office and drop it off there most of the brokerages at least here in el paso they have a receptionist up at the front desk between nine to most offices here between nine to three at least um and what i do is i actually have the client drop it off again a little tip on the productivity side, don't do stuff you don't have to do that's just gonna cost you hours of your time and doing things that really matter. That's actually the client's responsibility to deposit this money. So you tell them where to go and who to deposit it to and who to ask for, you set them up for it, but let them do it. Now, some clients, usually because of their work schedule, they're not as flexible, they can't get to it, then it's your call as the agent. I've done it before plenty of times. I'm not opposed to it, but it's not something that I offer up front. So if my client needs it, yes, I will stop at their job and pick up the checks. You know, I'll make a t accommodations to meet with their son at so-and-so or whatever the case may be, but don't use that as your first recourse. The first, the first step is that they should be doing that on their own. All right, so now we've got option money and we've got earnest money in. What do we do next if we're the buyer's agent? We need to set the inspection. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I swallowed so wrong. <laughs> Time out. <laughs> I got excited because you had the right answer so quick, Ethel. <laughs> so yes, we have to set the inspection appointment ASAP. Once you've gotten the earnest money and the option money out of the way, now set the inspection. Some agents will do all of this at the same time. I think it's okay to do it at the same time, but to be completely honest, for most buyers, it's just too much at once. 
And so you have to give them little bits and pieces. And like I said, even though they have three days to get you the option and the earnest money, I ask them for it as soon as possible. So some of my clients get it to me the first day, some of them get it to me the, the second day, most of them don't wait until that third day because I've given them uh, the sense of urgency to get it as quickly as possible. So then I'm actually scheduling the inspection the second or third day once the option, um, once the option money is in and once the earnest money is in. Either way, on the listing side, the listing agent doesn't want you setting up inspections if you haven't deposited your earnest money or your option money either. So they appreciate getting that first before you start setting up inspections also, okay? So now we've set up inspections. Yesterday we had an awesome training with AAA inspections. Um, <clears throat> there's a few ways you can go about inspections. I've done a few different things. When I first started, I, I tried a few different methods. Um, Basically what I let them know is, hey, you guys have the opportunity to choose your inspector. Is there somebody that you already want to go with? Nine out of 10 of your clients don't have somebody in mind. Every once in a while, they will have somebody and they'll say, yes, there's this inspector that I wanna use. Okay, awesome. Would you like for me to set up your, ins your, your inspection or do you have time to do so? Again, uh, use your time efficiently. If you're not in a position to be able to schedule their, their inspection as quickly as possible, ask them to do it. Um, and then once you're in a better position to help, just follow up and make sure that they did it. At the same time, you know, a lot of this is the help that we provide our clients. That's why it's nice to have a preferred inspection company because you have everything so easily accessible with them. You already have the prices. You already know what the method is to order and how quickly they're going to get out there. So it's a lot more streamlined. <clears throat> so um, what I do now is, like I said, I'll ask them if there's anybody that they would like to go with. And I let them know, okay, there's a list of inspectors um, that are certified here or licensed here in El Paso. You can use any of them. Um, here's the list. The, the two that I, I see used most frequently are these two, and there are two that I see used most frequently, and they're pretty good inspectors. Triple um, <clears throat> A being one of them. That's my preferred inspector. Also, Integrity Inspections is a pretty good inspector. I will tell you, AAA right now is definitely getting most all my business because they're actually able to go out to the house in two days. A lot of inspectors just are so booked that they're setting their appointments four or five days out, and that's really what's keeping them from getting a lot of people's business. So <clears throat> I'll go ahead and set the inspection appointment. Um, like I said, I don't go to inspections anymore, but if you're new, go to the inspections. I guarantee you this will set you apart from a lot of realtors. Ask questions while you're out there. Learn as much as you can. Make sure that when they go through the report, if there's something that you didn't understand, they're, they're presenting the report to your client. They're not presenting it to you. You're just there. But as, you, as they're going through it, if you have a question, ask. The question might be, is this a minor repair or is it a major repair? Do you know more or less how much this would cost to fix? A lot of the items on your inspection report you will see are five to $10 fixes. Just because they're minor doesn't mean that they don't go on the report. So this helps you in the future better read the report because a lot of the questions that you're gonna get on the inspection report are the exact same question over and over and over again from your clients. Now you're not an inspector, so again, you don't want to be held liable for something you said. Please make sure that you're being very careful with what you say. You always let them know I'm not an inspector, um, <clears throat> but from what I know and from what I understand, you know, the last time something like this came up on a report, inspector said X, Y, and Z. Um, I also did a lot of estimates, so you can get estimates for your clients if they're hesitant on what all this stuff looks like you might wanna go ahead and get some estimates for them to see how much the repair is gonna cost. That's another way you learn. Go out there with the contractor, go out there with the handyman and talk to them and ask them questions when you're out there. Don't just ask them questions specific on this report, ask them in general, for example. Let's say there is stucco 
and it has cracks. This is something that's very common in El Paso. Our stucco cracks and it's going to come out on your inspection report. Well, you can take a handyman out there and he's going to tell you, oh, well, with cracks like these, these are very normal. All you need to do is seal them. It's, it's, it's really, honestly, it's like a $10 job that anybody can do by themselves. But I want to learn a little bit more about stucco. Okay, well, when does it stop becoming a $10 job? How do I know if the cracks are too large and there needs to be a different method of, of patching that? They'll explain that to you. Now I know if it's thicker than a quarter, then it's not a regular maintenance crack. That's something that I learned throughout the years from the inspectors. Um, another thing is what about how much does it cost to actually get the entire thing um, repainted? And what most contractors and inspectors will tell you is, well, you might as well just do another coat of stucco on uh, the elastomatic paint or whatever. And it's basically another coat and that's gonna run you usually about $8,000. Um, so these are little things that I've picked up that again, I always let them know, like I'm not an inspector, I'm not a handyman, I'm not a contractor. So if you want a more exact estimate, we can go and get one. But of what I know and what I've seen, this is more or less. This will help save you guys some time also. Um, that way, initially, I was going and getting estimates for everything. Every single inspection report that came back, I was getting an, uh, an estimate. Now, um, I rely a lot more one, heavily. One question, mm -hmm. uh, Denise, when the, when the inspector came, uh, comes with the, with the report, Mm -hmm. And they say you have to, there is a crack, they have to fix it, or you have to fix it. Or the, the things that are really important uh, on that house, do they give you an estimate or mm -hmm. not? Okay, just the things that are not in well condition. They, yeah, just what's wrong with it. And then you can go and get a, an estimate afterwards. But <clears throat> I share these stories just so you guys can see, like, this is how you're going to learn. I'm not going to have all the answers for you via Zoom. It's really out in the field doing it and practicing it and then talking to the other professionals that know 10 times what I know and picking up on what they're telling you. And that's why it's important for you guys to pick a good team too. you know, who's your inspector? My preferred inspector might not be the best inspector for you for whatever reason. Maybe you guys just don't click. Maybe you don't communicate very well. Maybe it's a different time and he's not as accessible as he used to be to me. I don't know. But build your team with strong, knowledgeable people so that you can become strong and knowledgeable also. And they're going to they're gonna ask the same thing of you too. You know, they're going to they're gonna gain uh, value from having you at their side as their partner also and coming to you with questions. Um, so, all right. So we've gotten the inspection done. Now we've gotten the, now we look, we look and see what the, what the report says and what repairs our clients might need. Now at that point, if we need to get estimates, we can get estimates. Again, I always ask my clients if there's anybody that they have already in mind for their repairs. If there is, let's go ahead and set them up to come in here. Remember always making sure that you're confirming with the listing agent that it's okay for you to go in and access the property. Um, unless it's vacant and available and that's been made clear to you from the beginning, make sure that you're setting these appointments with the listing agent um, and be mindful that a lot of times there is a family still living there. So don't wait until the last minute before you let them know. As soon as you have a time in mind, let them know. Um, that way you guys can make accommodations. So I always talk about being a realtor is kind of like being a party planner or being a wedding planner because it's a lot of coordinating. We're coordinating a lot of different people to be at the same place at the same time or be out of the same place at the same time or get documents in at a certain time. It's a lot of coordinating. So just make sure you're on top of your communication and keeping everybody in the loop, okay? So now we've got an estimates on a couple of items that the client was a little concerned with. Um, now, so there's two ways you can go about it. You don't have to get the estimates up front. You can actually just ask for the repairs from the seller and let them get the estimates because they're usually gonna get estimates anyways. 
Um, I kind of learned that the hard way, even if you get estimates and you provide them to them, thinking that you've done them a favor by doing some work for them, a lot of times you haven't. They still want to go and get their own estimates because they don't really trust the people that you sent out there. So um, usually I get the repairs that they're concerned with and send it to the seller as soon as possible if we're trying to have them do the repairs themselves. If we're not trying to get them to do the repair the repairs themselves and we just want a credit for it, then I'll get the estimate. Um, and I have found that it that in this market, it might be a little bit easier to negotiate a credit, honestly. Um, a lot of sellers just don't want to do anything to their property. Um, you might want to talk to the listing agent ahead of time and see what kind of seller are they? Are they open to doing repairs? Um, a lot of times they'll tell you, hey, you know, they're open to repairs. They're a, it's, they're a handyman. They'll, they'll go ahead and do it themselves. You'll get to see inside the house, like you can usually tell if there's a handyman living there, the condition of the property is like pristine or sometimes they're a handyman, but the fixes aren't the best. So, <laughs> so you can kind of tell. Um, and then, so we'll ask for that, negotiate back and forth. Now make sure that when you're negotiating, you're negotiating within the option period, okay? So that's why it's so important to get that inspection done as soon as possible, because let's say you have 10 days of option period. I got Ernest and option money in by day two. I scheduled the inspection on day two for day four. I got the inspection report on day four. I talked to my buyer about it in the evening of day four to figure out what they want and don't want. Now, whether I send that amendment that night or the next morning, now we're on day five, we're halfway through option uh, period, that should be plenty of time for me to negotiate where we're going to go from here to the next step. That's why it's so important for you to do this so quickly because that time went by so fast, even though I was pushing and pushing and pushing for them to do it as quickly as possible. Okay. So best case scenario buyer and seller they come to some agreement now we've agreed on the on, on the repairs that are going to be done or maybe a credit that's going to be given um, or maybe nothing at all it's possible as a buyer's agent don't always assume that something's going to be what wrong with the house or that you're always going to get a credit or that you're always going to get a repair that's not the case don't always assume that um, so now we're, we've gotten past that, what do we do next? I'm the buyer's agent, remember, what do I do next? We need to see if the lender approved the, oh, oh, how is it? I don't know if the title company talks to the lender or we have to make sure that the lender is going to lend the money to these people. <laughs> So you're right. So let's say we're on about day 10 right now. The lender has been working on the file for a bit. You do want to make sure that you're maintaining that communication between yourself and the lender within that time. Um, don't be overbearing either. Um, let them do their thing because their process is a little bit different than ours is. We're used to go, 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 and it's in my hands now, and then I'm going to throw it out and get rid of it. Um, theirs is similar, but their turnaround times are a lot longer. Like with almost anything that you give a lender, it has to go to processing and then it has to go to underwriting. And most of the time their turnaround time is going to be about three days or more for anything that they turn in. So usually what I do, and again, this is part of creating a good team that you trust. Um, at this point, I kind of just give my lenders their space, but I will check in sometime, um, sometime in option period. Remember they got the contract. So as soon as they get the executed agreement, they're working. They're like, all right, we got it. The next thing they should be doing is they should be sending out the disclosures to the clients and asking them for, for their documents. So usually that's happening at the same time that you're asking for option and earnest money. After that, usually the lender doesn't have too much to do because the documents have gone to underwriting and processing and they're just kind of waiting. So yes, throughout the entire process, follow up with your lender, but don't be overbearing either. Just make sure, hey, where are you at with the file? I just want to check up. Um, is there anything that you need from me? 
something that the lenders do need from us sometimes is to to give the client that little push to give them what they're asking for sometimes the client responds to us a little bit differently than they respond to the lender and the lender will have a harder time getting requested documents from the clients than we will um, i believe one of the reasons that is is because we have an actual we, we have an actual face-to-face -face, um, relationship with them they know that they're gonna see us again <laughs> uh, it's kind of like have you ever owed somebody money and you know you're gonna see them this weekend and you're like let me not spend this money because when I see them this weekend I need to pay them I don't want to be around them and not have their money so it's kind of like that I think they know that they're gonna see us so they're just quicker to respond to us Plus, usually they have a stronger relationship with us than they do with the lender. Um, so if anything, sometimes they might need a little bit of help from you to get certain documents that they've requested and they've requested and requested and they're not getting it. That's when you step in, Ethel. And that's when you come in and you say, uh, hey, Mr. Buyer, just following up with you. Um, Mrs. Lender said that she's been trying to get a hold of you to send your pay stubs um, and you're having a hard time getting them to her uh like what's going on when are you going to be able to get that you know what it's because i've been at work and i'm working overtime right now and i really just have not had a chance i have them on me but i just don't have a chance to drive to the east side to do that no worries i got you i'm going to go ahead and send my assistant or i'm going to stop by and pick them up for you once your lunch hour i'll stop by then um and get this handled okay so that's the kind of things that we can definitely help them with um, that's both helpful to our client and to the lender. That's going above and beyond, to be completely honest. It is. That's not really our job, but you got to do what you got to do to get the job done. And sometimes it's as simple as picking up a document to go and deliver it or helping them deliver the earnest money or whatever. Okay, so um, the next thing that we need to do as a buyer's agent actually is since we're following up with the lender, let the lender know that we are done with inspections and we're ready to order the appraisal. Another thing to look out for is some, some lenders will order the appraisal as soon as they get an executed agreement. I'm not a fan of this and I don't recommend it. The reason why is because what if we go and get an inspection done and we cannot come to an agreement on the repairs and we cannot come to an agreement on a credit and the house is not in the condition that the buyer thought it was. And the buyer tells you, you know what? Um, I know I have until day 10 to terminate this agreement, Denise, I'm going to go ahead and use that. I just don't feel comfortable with this purchase. I'm sorry. I wasted your time. Can we please look for another house? Of course, Mr. Buyer, that's what that time is there for. It's there to protect you. Oh, but wait, the appraisal was ordered on day one. So now you have a balance due with the lender of an extra $600 that you didn't agree to. Who's going to pay for that? Your buyer's not going to be happy. So I talk to my lenders, especially for you guys that are making new relationships with lenders. I let them know. My lenders now know. They don't, they, they just don't do it. Um, but initially, do not order the appraisal until I have gotten through the inspection um, process and we are good to go on, on that end. Just don't order it. As soon as we get through that, though, you have to make it a point to let them know, hey, green light, go ahead and order it because appraisals do take longer to come in. They take longer to get somebody out there, especially right now with COVID, they're just taking so much longer. So do your part to make sure you let them know as soon as the inspection process is done. So now that gets done, they take care of ordering it. You just have to give them the green light. Um, now, the next thing that we need to do is uh, insurance. Okay, this would be a good time for you guys to link up with the insurance company. You know what? And insurance, actually, you might want to link up with them during the option period. 
because what they can provide us with is actually with a clue report. And I have some insurance companies that tell me, Denise, as soon as you get the contract executed, let me get you a clue report because it's actually something that we can use during our negotiations too. So it's a lot within that 10 day period, but if you can get it done within that 10 day period, go ahead and do that. The clue report, it basically clues you in on any, um, on any policies that have uh, been taken out on the, on the homeowner's insurance. So why is this important to a buyer? Well, let's say that they had a, let's say that they had a claim two years ago and the claim was for hail damage and the title policy granted the homeowners $10,000 for a new roof. They got $10,000 for a new roof. So our buyers should be buying a two year old roof. A two year old roof is great. It should be in great condition. Um, and, and that should be great for the buyer. But then we go into the inspection and the roof is busted. Like it's just, well, what's going on there? Now there's questions, okay? Now this is something that we can negotiate and because we have a clue report saying, hey, Mr. Listing Agent, um, we know that the seller got money to repair this two years ago. What's going on? Are they gonna repair it for us? Did anything get done on it? This is also helpful for your negotiations. Um, so try to get that done within the 10 days if you, if you can, um, that'll be helpful. Um, but after the option period, now you need to remind your buyer, and this is something that the lender will do too, but you might need to remind the buyer, um, from what I've seen, to start shopping for their homeowner's insurance. I do like to remind my buyer again, because most of the time they don't know exactly where to go. So I usually start with the exact same question. Do you already have somebody in mind for homeowner's insurance? If the answer is no, this one you'll get maybe seven times out of 10, you'll get a no because usually people have uh, insurance for like their car um, and they wanna shop that place first or if they own a home currently that they're selling, they wanna stay with them. Um, but if they don't have anybody, then I wanna send them my preferred insurance partner, okay? Why do I have a preferred insurance partner? One, for clue reports. Clue reports don't take very long to come in if you have a preferred insurance partner. Some insurance agents are just very busy. If they don't know who you are or what you're about, it might take a little while to get a clue report. But we get provided with clue reports. Um, and in exchange, they offer my clients very good service. I don't get anything out of this. I get quotes. And I know that they're gonna take care of my client well um, as far as the getting them their estimates and all of that good stuff. So, hi, good morning. Good morning. How are you doing? So, well, um, so insurance is next and that's just a friendly reminder, okay? Friendly um, reminder to, for them to get their insurance. Okay. Oh, wow. All right, I'm just going over my list really quick. Now we've got in homeowner's insurance. We're almost done. All we're really waiting for is for the lender to finish their documents, um, which is gonna be just finalizing the pre-approval. Most of them at this point are almost done. They've probably already sent the file into underwriting um, and underwriting is basically just the people that give us the final approval. Um, and then they might have a condition, what they call a condition. So basically, they will get an initial approval and then they might get something called a condition that basically says you have been approved with the condition that you provide uh, an appraisal that comes in at value or with the condition that you provide the final pay stub that we're waiting for or with the condition that you provide proof of proof that you get child support or verification of employment, whatever that is, but it's already been scanned for the most part and we're just missing one or two little things. Um, so we're just waiting on that, we're waiting on the appraisal and now the week of closing, what's the last thing that we need to do before we start setting up for, uh, for closing with our client? One more thing that we need to do with them. 
No? We have to do a final walkthrough, okay? So try to do your final walkthrough. I recommend, if you can do it two days before, do it two days before. This just gives you the time in case something is found that's off that you need to address. It gives you an entire day to address it. Um, you can do it the day before. It's cutting it a little close, but a lot of clients like to do it the day before also because they don't want too much time to lapse between the time that they do their final walkthrough and the time that they actually close. Um, so I would re recommend two, one to two days before. Three days before, is a, it's, it's a little bit larger of a gap, still semi-safe. Um, but, but I would say two, two days to one day before. Don't forget to do that final walkthrough though. Okay. What are you looking for at the final walkthrough? That the repairs are made if you, if you, uh, negotiate repairs. And that Actually, that should have been taken care of a while ago. Try to get that figured out as quickly as possible. So that's something that you need to stay on top of the listing agent. Um, once, you re once you agree to repairs, and that's why I like doing credits, because then I don't have to worry about, did they do the repairs or didn't they? Hey, when are they gonna be done? Hey this, hey that. And it's a lot of going back and forth, especially if it's a lot of repairs. Um, but if they are doing repairs, try to have, try to have, try to be on top of that sooner than later. I've even gone as far as when I do um, negotiate repairs, I'll ask that they be done three days before closing. And this is helpful because the day of the final walkthrough, you really don't want to be looking for stuff like that. You want that to be done beforehand. Um, that, that's actually, I'm glad you brought that up. That was something that I learned with my very first closing. It was like the last day and I still didn't know <laughs> if the repairs had been done and that's just not a good time to be trying to figure that out so try to have them done at least three days before um, if you need to add it into the amendment with the repairs repairs um x y and z to be done three days before closing that would be a good idea also um, but the, the day of the final walkthrough really what we're looking for is we're looking to see that they removed all their personal property first Okay, this is important because it is their job to remove their property. Okay, you don't want your client going in and the owner that was there before left a bunch of junk there for them. That's not cool. Your client's not going to be happy. That's not okay. Um, it's actually in the agreement that they need to take their personal property. So that's why I say I like to do it two to one day before, just in case something's there then I'm letting them know, hey, tomorrow we're coming back. And that's still the day before closing. So if we need to push back closing, we'll push it back. But look, I'm on top of my stuff. I'm here. Your client clearly left a mess um, in the garage or in the backyard or whatever the case may be. That's probably the most common one. Second, you want to make sure that nothing was taken that wasn't supposed to be taken. So for example, in a lot of our homes, we ask in the non-realty item addendum that the refrigerator be left over. What if you ask for the refrigerator and the refrigerator was taken out? That's something that you wanna see at the final walkthrough. Um, and maybe it was just a miscommunication. And so, hey, they took the refrigerator, um, what's going on? Oh, really? They weren't supposed to take it, let me call them. Oh, uh, just a miscommunication. They'll bring it back tomorrow. Okay, great. We'll come back tomorrow to check on it. Okay. So that's why I like doing it two days for me as a sweet spot, two days before closing. Um, obviously, they shouldn't be pulling out ceiling fans, anything that's permanently attached to the walls, anything that was included in the property needs to be in the property still. And then you guys can go ahead and set up, schedule your closing. So once the title company says that it's okay to set, uh, schedule closing, you can go ahead and do that with your client. Now, right now, because of COVID, closings look a little bit different. A lot of the title companies are not letting us into the office. Um, 
I like to make it a habit to go to the closing if I can go to the closing. And I let them know from the very beginning, if I can go to the closing, I will go to the closing. Um, as a realtor, you really don't need to be there, to be completely honest. There's not much for you to do. You're really just there for moral support and to congratulate them, but they really appreciate it when you're there. They really do. You got them through the process and your job was to get them to the closing table. Now we're at the closing table and you're not here. They're looking around like, okay. Um, and, and I did notice this one time I went into a closing with a client and there was a family sitting in the waiting room and you know, I'm, I'm a talker. So I just, you know, asked them like, Hey, are you guys closing on your house today? You buying a new home? yeah we're selling our house but our agent's not here and they were just very upset about it like they did not understand why i was there with my clients and their agent was not there um i tried to clean it up for them a little bit i was like oh well in reality like there's not really a reason for us to be here we're just kind of here for moral support <laughs> um, but I felt bad I really felt bad because they were really upset about it and and I could see why it's our job to get them from A to Z so if you're missing that last day it might look a certain way remember don't be oblivious to the fact that realtors do have a reputation we do unfortunately at the end of the day a lot of people still look at us just as salespeople, and some people think that maybe we're just doing it for the money and we're just greedy and we just want to sell the house and then never hear from us again so i like to show up to closings if i can show up to closings um and then take a gift take a thank you card um if you're not super crafty and you can't put together a gift basket it's okay just take a thank you card maybe with a little gift card inside of it it doesn't have to be anything huge and extravagant but always thank them for giving the for giving you the opportunity to work for them um if you're a realtor you understand that having a client is a very valuable thing this is how we get paid this is how we feed our family this is how we buy what we need to buy this is how we make a living for ourselves and they had to to put it into perspective for you they had almost 2,000 other choices they could have chosen one of the other 2,000 realtors in El Paso, and they chose you to help them. So thank them. A thank you card goes a very, very long way. Show up, thank them. If you can take a little gift, a little goodie, maybe a, a bottle of wine. Here in El Paso, a lot of people are drinkers. You guys know that. Um, a bottle of tequila goes a very long way with somebody that's a drinker. Also, keep in mind what kind of client you have. Not everybody drinks, so that might not be the best gift. Um, you can do something a little more generic. Sometimes if I don't know whether they drink or not, I'll do a little gift basket with coffee and tea and some mugs. It's a little bit more generic with my thank you card. Um, but there's a lot of things that you can do. Really, more than anything, just keep in mind for a buyer, this is a celebration. So how would you celebrate something else? If you go to a birthday party, you usually take a gift or you take some food or you make a big ruckus about it, you know, celebrate it. This is a moment of celebration. So celebrate it with them. Even if you're not able to make it to the closing, I understand you probably won't make it to every single closing, celebrate them and thank them for that opportunity. And on that note, I'm going to thank you guys for the opportunity for letting me come into this chat with you guys and talk to you. And hopefully you guys got something out of this. My goal is just to help everybody be just 1% better. I want to be 1% better every day. If we can be 1% better every day after a year, we're 365% better and it'll add up and add up and add up. So um, thank you guys. I'm going to open it up for questions now. Anybody have questions? No? Thank you, Ethel, for always showing your face. Oh, <laughs> you're welcome. I don't feel like I'm talking to myself. I love how <laughs> Yeah, I know. That's why I'm sorry. Because it will be like just 
nothing <laughs> guys at least add a picture you guys are going to be doing these conference calls with your clients now too so get comfortable being on here i really do appreciate you being on here in video i like the picture connie i get to see something um but you guys kind of have to get comfortable with this because COVID isn't going anywhere so um at this i think to date in this year i think i've sold three homes from clients around the world that didn't see the house before they bought it. It was sight unseen. So you have to get comfortable with stuff like this if you want to open up the opportunities also for your clients um, because this is the way that it's going to work. So I appreciate you guys being out here, even if you're not showing your face. I know that is a, it is a little bit uncomfortable at first to get used to, um, but I love seeing you guys' faces. I love seeing that you guys show up and I really hope you guys got something out of this. If you think of any other questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. I will be posting um, this on YouTube. You're welcome, Lilia. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I'll be posting this on YouTube. So if you had to step away for, for any moment and you missed anything, you can go back and rewatch it. If you have friends that are realtors or thinking of becoming realtors and you wanna help them get a jump start in the business, please share my page. Um, I know the, the the, it's not the most lavish training and it's not the cutest video, but it's just the information that we're trying to get out and trying to help realtors become better realtors every day. Um, so I hope you guys have a wonderful, wonderful weekend, wonderful Labor Day weekend. Remember, we're celebrating ourselves. We have helped the economy grow um, by being realtors. We are essential workers. You know, we've helped the economy thrive in these trying times. Um, but please post, put yourself out there. If you're doing open houses, please stay safe. Make sure you wear your mask. Make sure you have your hand sanitizer there. Um, and then always be very safe and secure when you're showing homes also, especially you ladies. Um, I will talk to you guys. Our next, our next, uh, you're welcome, Violeta. Thank you so much for showing up. Our next training won't be until Tuesday. I will not be in the office on Monday. I'll be out celebrating Labor Day as well. I will be, I will have my phone. So if you have any questions, feel free to call. Um, but I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye. Enjoy your weekend. Thank you, Denise. You too, Denise. Thank you so much, guys. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank you, Ethel. Bye-bye.